Hello and welcome to News Click. You're watching Present, Past and the Future. Recently, the Seh Sarkarya Vaha or Joint General Secretary of Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, Krishna Gopal, made a laudatory reference to Mughal prince and elder brother of Emperor Aurangzeb, Dara Shuko. Krishna Gopal said, Dara Shuko, had he been the emperor, the face of Islam in India and the story of the country would have been completely different. This was not surprising, although on the face of it, RSS praise for a Mughal prince appears odd. Krishna Gopal's statement was in fact not so much about finding virtues in Mughals, but about creating a binary between the good Muslim and the bad Muslim. The bad Muslim in this case is Aurangzeb, whose public image is poles apart from the understanding of historians and other scholars who have spent decades trying to decipher its complexities. For long, the RSS has championed the view that Aurangzeb's conflict with Dara Shuko was essentially a battle between Islamic orthodoxy and liberalism. That after Aurangzeb's victory and Dara Shuko's death, Islam in India retreated into a sectarian box because the window of pluralism which Dara Shuko opened was shut permanently. This is how the Hindutva narrative of 1200 years of slavery or as they say in Hindi, Bara So Saal Ki Gulami came about. The Sangh Pariwa's demonization of Aurangzeb is not new. The government changed the name of Aurangzeb Road. Initially, the road was supposed to be named after Dara Shuko, but because Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam died around the same time, it was named after him. The Sangh Parivar now tries hard to appear reasonable when it comes to Muslims. Mohan Bhagwat made the startling statement two years ago that Hindutva minus Muslims is meaningless. Although this assertion itself made little sense. The idea is not to accept Muslims for what they are, but to create an ideal role model in the present and in the past. In contemporary times, it is easy to co-opt politicians and others by offering official recognition and the lure of office. Thereafter, others can follow them. When it comes to history, the present shapes the past. History and historians are indeed unfortunate. It is presumed no scholarship is needed because folklore is mostly parodied as history. For the rest of it, there is of course the internet. We must reduce the gap between Aurangzeb and Dara Shiko's public image and what is historically truthful. Much of our present is contested on false reading of the past, especially Aurangzeb. Professor Harbans Mukhya, the renowned medieval historian who taught at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, will help me correct misconceptions on the rivalry between Dara Shuko and Aurangzeb. We will also talk about the false reading of the past and how it impinges on the present. Professor Mukhya, welcome. Thank uh, you. My first question, you know, obviously, <coughs> you know, to begin to dispel the first <laughs> Myth or the first wrong understanding? Shiko or Shuko? <laughs> Popularly, majority of the places, Dara Shiko, Dara Shiko, it goes on. But what one understands from an historian like you is that it should actually be Dara Shuko. Well, it is actually uh, Dara Shuko. Uh, you know, uh, when you write Shuko in Persian, right. you can read it in many different ways. You can read it as Shiko, Shuko. Shuku, Shako, okay. and so on. Right. You know? Now, if you put some fine sort of accentuate, ex, uh, finely accentuate it, you right. can make the difference. But, uh, but that's not done. Usually, it's, it's mm. not done, and therefore, uh, uh, Shiko has become somehow 
more popularly accepted than Chukot. But you know, the, there is a world of difference between the two, two, two terms. Shiko means terror and okay. Shuko means glory. So the man who was such a glorious man is being so, reduced so to… if we continue to use Shiko, then it will be completely false reading it, and misinterpretation. It will, it will reduce the man to a terror that, or rather than Thank to you. the glory you that's… Yeah. You have corrected this wrong <laughs> understanding and the way the, this misspelt and mispronounced, you know, very important. But more moving on to a more yes, important yes. issue, you know, which is that this existing understanding, what we call the public memory, that Shuko was the good man and Aurangzeb was the bad man, that it was essentially a fight between Islamic orthodoxy and liberalism, which was at heart, you know, that essentially the conflict between the two brothers is looked through the prism of religion and understanding of religion. Well, you know, uh, uh, two things about it. One, that this contest between liberalism and orthodoxy is, is not reflected in the contemporary literature, historical literature or outside. Mm. Uh, in the 17th century, early 18th century, nobody looks at this contest as, as between Aurangzeb and Lara Shuko as a contest between two competing ideologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and these historians are Muslim historians, Hindu historians, literatures and so on and so forth. They, they mm. don't look at it. Uh, in terms of their as a really as a, as a conflict between uh, two religious ideologies mm. you know now it is quite true that uh, dara shuko as a person as a scholar was very different from aurangzeb right. and but different different in terms of his understanding of religions different uh, also in 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 terms of in other terms you know that's not the only difference it's completely a different personality it's different personality altogether you know, uh, different in terms of uh, uh, their competence as governors, different in terms of <coughs> their competence as uh, managers of imperial, uh, imperial finances, different in terms of as administrators, as military commanders and so on. Mm. So there are many differences, you know, when you look at an emperor, you don't look upon him merely as a symbol of orthodoxy or religio or, or religiosity or mm. liberalism and so on and so forth. You, know, you look at the emperor, uh, any emperor, in terms of a whole personality, you see. Mm. Uh, so, 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 you know, when you contrast Dwara Shuko to Aurangzeb, mm. the contrast is limited entirely to their uh, respective views of religion, you know, mm. which are very radically different, true. Mm. But nonetheless, uh, there are other differences as well. True. And, and there is a reason why uh, this is so, you see. The reason is that uh, 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 those who do so, they wish to pitch history in terms of pitch the study of history entirely in religious terms. History right. is... Uh, no, it's a, very clearly, you know, broken down into phases. You have the Hindu phase of history, you have the Muslim phase of history, and you have the British phase of India. Yeah, history. well, that that's given to us actually by James Mill. You know this yeah. this uh, this nomenclature. And taken forward by the Hindu, right? Wing. Yeah, now it is yes, it's yes. So you know, uh, a great problem there is that uh, uh, one that uh, history has history study of history has advanced to a much much great to a great degree mm -hmm. from this kind of binary opposites of. Uh, Hindu right. versus religion, Hindu versus Islam, you know. Uh, you, you have also pointed out, you know, that when the conflict actually takes place between Aurangzeb and Dara Shuko, you know, it is a, the very important uh, Hindu nobleman or the Hindu general who are lined up behind Aurangzeb. Yes, I, 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 was, I was referring to it in a way, indirectly, in that, you know, the contemporaries don't look upon it, either contemporary historians or even contemporary dramatis personae. Uh, don't look upon it in terms of uh, either orthodox Islam or liberal Islam or Hindu mm -hmm. versus Muslim. For example, uh, uh, Professor Athar Ali had made this uh, study uh, mm -hmm. back in 1966, I think, right. uh, uh, where he showed that of the mansabdars or nobles mm -hmm. uh, from the rank of 500 onwards, uh, uh, 500 upwards, uh, 24 Hindu nobles supported Dara Shuko and 21 
Hindu no word support so it's almost Aurangzeb. like you know split down so, the middle. Oh, oh, absolutely, you know. And and of these twenty one who supported Aurangzeb, two were the most outstanding generals. You know, one was General uh, Gen um, uh, Jai Singh, Raja Jai Singh. The other was just one Singh. Uh, the other was just one Singh. That the most outstanding right. generals of Aurangzeb's time. You know, so Shah it would be a complete time. wrong, you know, to say that. Aurangzeb was backed mainly by Muslim orthodoxy. Far from it. It would also be wrong completely to say that had Dara Shuko become uh, the emperor, then there would have been a much more uh, non-centralized, uh, uh, you know, Mughal state. Well, you know, uh, how Dara Shuko would have functioned, we don't know. Yes. It you know, one can only guess. It's like saying, you know, that had Sadar Patel been India's prime minister, <laughs> right. India's future would have been right, completely exactly, different. Exactly, you know. We don't know that, you yes. know. But, you know, uh, emperors or for, for that matter presidents or prime ministers don't function, don't operate things just that they want to. You see, right. there are many constraints on the function, particularly historical as go, compulsions also. Exactly, yeah. you know, historical structural compulsions, compulsions of what kind of ruling class you have, the and the alliances the that you have alliances to build, most within that, tensions within the ruling class, and so on and so forth. You know, uh, so that uh, a, a, an emperor has to manage all of these. You know, and he do, he just can't be unidimensional. Either he's orthodox or he's liberal. You know, uh, mm. an emperor has to has to has to take many stances at different points of time according to the uh, the the issues that he faces at that time you know uh, or for that matter as i said any president or prime minister today you know so they, they their stances differ uh, from time to time and from our context to context so so to say that if if Aurangzeb had been replaced by, or if, or if Dara Shuko had been the emperor rather than Aurangzeb, things would have been radically different. You know, is to mm -hmm. say, is to is to go too far in your imagination. You know, it's a, it's not historically a very highly uh, valid statement. You know, you had some time ago said, you know, that in the, uh, you know, immediately after the death of Aurangzeb, at that point, you know, or even the contemporary historians when he was alive, people were not looking at him through the prism of religion and, you know, his attitude towards religion, juxtaposing it with uh, Dara Shuko. When does interpretation of history from what we can say, the religious uh, aspect, or from what we call a communal perspective, when does it really begin, especially in the context of this period that we're talking about? Well, you know, uh, from the late 18th century, mid or late 18th century, th things begin to change in society, you know, in the sense that uh, uh, identity politics or identity uh, formations begin to emerge, uh, strong identity formation, they were there earlier. But strong assertion of identity formations begin to emerge from the from the mid or late 18th century. You know, on both sides, mm -hmm. you see, uh, uh, Shah Waliullah, uh, you know, asserted the Islamic identity uh, for the Muslim community. Others on the Hindu side, and so on and so forth. So that uh, once once uh, this identity begins, the sort of begin becomes the. Uh, entry point into the study of society and therefore of history you know then things begin to change they are they are now uh, being studied in terms of uh, you know uh, the religious identities of the or religious attitudes of the rulers this that or the other you know mm. also that this was uh, uh, how the british uh, uh, British administrative historians promoted it. You see, mm -hmm. they promoted history, entire Indian history, particularly elsewhere also, but Indian history particularly, in terms of these identities. You see, religious identities. Religious identities. You know, now you know. Prior to that, history was written in terms of the individual ruler's will, individual ruler's nature or disposition or will. You know. Uh, uh, Skills and capacities also, maybe. Yes, indeed, yes. So that, you know, uh, a, a great uh, ruler like Akbar would expand the empire, establish a huge empire, efficient uh, empire. Even Aurangzeb was, was a, you know, he expanded yeah, considerably. Yeah, yeah, centralized no, power. Yeah, yeah, no, but I'm saying something different, you know. Hmm. A, a, 
uh, and a very strong ruler will, ruler will expand the empire, govern it very efficiently mm. with great power and so on and so forth. A weak ruler will let it let the empire flounder and disintegrate and so on and so forth. This is how history was studied. You know, in terms of the historical events were looked upon as the manifestation of the ruler's disposition or will or nature, if you like. You know, mm. uh, and. Every ruler's disposition or nature is different from every other ruler's, you see. Mm. Now, what came to be uh, the case, particularly under the British administrator and historian's uh, guidance mm. and the formation of these identities, as I said, uh, was that all of these uh, all of these variations in the assessment of rulers came to be displaced by one single ident one single entry point namely religion you know mm. so you study history in terms of the religious identity of the not of one ruler but of the entire period you mm. know muslim period which means the rule of the muslims muslim rule islamic rule and so on and so forth whereas that is not the truth the that's not the, that that's they would have been or a Hindu large period of... earlier, or so on and so forth. You know, so you know this is not true because uh, one uh, to call it Islamic period, Islamic rule, or uh, Muslim rule is to uh, assume that uh, the, the governance came only from one particular religion. No, that community. that one, that's one. But more important than that is that the rule was rule was. Uh, or governance followed only the Sharia, for example. Okay. You know, uh, it, uh, you know, with if the it purpose that politics was primarily also to push the interest of religion and yes, the religious state. Right. The state was subservient to, to the religion to and religion, the religious institutions, and therefore the state was uh, state existed to promote uh, religion, religion, a specific religion, specific religion, its own religion. And, and state governed according to the Sharia. You see, right. there is no other, you know, <clears throat> there is no other possibility of any kind of uh, jurisprudence right. allowed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Now that's not the case. You see, the uh, Sharia was applicable only in one aspect, namely criminal law. You know. Uh, but in civil law, for example, marriages and inheritance and family, etc., these were not uh, done. I mean, Muslims yes followed the Sharia, but others didn't follow the Sharia. Naturally, they did not. Hmm. Hindus didn't marry according to Sharia right. and inherited property according to Sharia, and so on and so forth. They they fo they followed their own codes and so on and so, so forth. You know. What you are saying, you know, in fact, I was reading uh, somewhere, and you have often said one sentence. You have really summarized everything. That history is very unfortunate because it is any, everybody's slave. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's the problem, you see. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Nilanjan, the, at a professional level, I mean, I uh, uh, happened to uh, have started studying history as an undergraduate in the second half of the 1950s. More than almost 60 years, if I'm yes, not 60, wrong. Yeah. Uh, 60 years, yes, really. 60 years at least. Yeah. yeah. In these 60 years, when I studied, when I was a student of history, BA and MA in late uh, 1950s, history was all about kings and queens and battles and administration exactly. and this, that and the Only other. Only about the ruling class. Yes, and not even ruling classes, you know, Just Akbar and Jahangir and uh, Alauddin Khalji and so on and so forth, you know, uh, uh, very boring history. Uh, since then, um, one doesn't have the time to go into it, but since then, History has, has it's a, it's a different world altogether. Right. You know, uh, history is the history of uh, mentalities, history of ideas, history of personal relationships, history of disease, history of ecology, history of almost anything that you can think of. History is expansive. You know, uh, it includes everything. You see. I can also add, you know, a very important point which you have made in one of your articles is also the history of. Erasing parts of history. Yes, it it is. Yes, uh, how you specifically referred uh, to the Marathas in right, your right. You know, uh, right. He, history is constantly being at a professional level. History is becoming very, very advanced, very sophisticated, very layered, very nuanced. You know, right. And uh, and very sort of you know uh, uh, rational, logical. You know. 
not one logic, one, one, not one reason, but nonetheless, all of these, all of diff different approaches are rational approaches, you know. Uh, and it's, it's gone long way off from Akbar and Jahangir's and their religious policy or that policy, etc. Very long way off, you know. But at the popular level, mm. uh, partly uh, it's ignorance, but more than ignorance, it's a perpet perpetuated ignorance, you know, or perpetu perpetuated, uh, perpetuated version of history, that history really means it's, Hindu you know, you, versus you, Muslim. Is, you come to a very important point when you say that it's a perpetuated version of history, which you're saying. We began this conversation by saying, you know, as to how an RSS leader had presented that uh, Dara Shukho was the ideal king, you know, and India's, uh, you know, story would have been completely different had he become the emperor. When we talk about history and as to how people have actually appropriated history and presented it, their version of history, you know, what do you think is the necessity? Besides being a historian, you are also a very sharp political mind in today's contemporary India, you know. So, how, where do you think does this necessity for what we can call, you know, of creating these binaries of a good Muslim and a bad Muslim, where does it actually come from? Well, you know, uh, um, it comes from the current state of politics. You see, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, fascinating aspects of uh, Indian polity is, since, since the constitution, since 1950, right is that it's a very extraordinarily modern polity, you know, with the universal adult franchise which came to exactly. India in 1950. You know, it's a fantastic... Much against the skepticism of a large number of people. Yes. Felt that such a large body of illiterate people... Yes, indeed, yes. And think of it, you know, uh, Indian electorate, Indian adult, French, adult franchise, universal adult franchise came to India in 1950. Right. Uh, French women got the right to wait in to vote in 1944, right. just six years ahead yes. of India. Yeah. Uh, uh, Swiss Swiss women got the right to vote in 1973, right. nearly a quarter century after, after. Indian women. Yes. You know, so it's a very modern polity. You know, we were far ahead of time. Far but now ahead of we many, seem to be going yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, but that's one aspect of the polity. You know, the other aspect of the polity is that. Uh, contrary to Nehru's uh, vision or expectation, mm. who thought that, you know, these uh, existing sort of consciousness of pre-modern consciousness of caste and community and region would, go, cetera, away would go away, you know, with experience and so on and so forth. But it know. did not. But it's on the contrary, uh, with the success of these kinds of mobilizing, uh, these, these are the categories with which electorate was mobilized, you know, caste and community and so on and so forth, you know. And now you know, religion. Uh, and religion. Then also, but more so now, you mm -hmm. know, uh, religion. Uh, they got, they've got consolidated uh, rather than withering away. Right. They've got consolidated but because they were, they were mobilized successfully, you know. So the very success of this mobilization has given them, reinforced their, their power, you see. And therefore, uh, there is this uh, situation today when we are more and more falling back upon these identities as the right. identities of political mobilization, as the identities for working our polity. You see, uh, we are getting, uh, once in a while you hear uh, uh, Vikas and, uh, and, and Sabka Saath Vagara, but you know, the, we realize that the polity is really being centered on fixated on the identity politics, you know, uh, mainly of uh, religion. This, this is where, you know, scholars like you are very important to actually present well, a, a right and a more distilled and a nuanced, uh, you know, type or version of history. Thank you, Professor uh, Mukhya. It's always a great pleasure to speak with you. History and historical figures are complex and multifaceted. They cannot be reduced into linear interpretations. It is always very tough to talk about history in short videos, but I hope we have initiated you to think and read more about Aurangzeb and Dara Shuko and not get swayed by simplistic understanding of the past. Thank you.